I'm Coco Novak, author, show host, and public speaker. Welcome to season two of the Coco Novak Show. In this season, we're going to delve deep into what makes us human, relationships, stories of failure that we learn from, and stories of success. It's going to be real, raw, and relatable. So stay tuned, hit that subscribe button, and enjoy. All right. Hi, Trey. Welcome uh, to Tuesday Talks. I'm so glad you could join us today from Colorado, USA. Thank you for having me. Today we'll be talking about how sports and working on yourself can transform your life, um, despite perhaps not having the most positive, I guess, um, start maybe to life or not having positive uh, an influence of adults in your life. So I found your story on Instagram. You're somehow ended up in my feed, um, which was amazing to see how um, you spoke to one of your children. So you are a jiu-jitsu coach, a black belt. You have your own um, gym now. And uh, you had a competition with one of the children uh, where one of the children didn't win or lost. And we're going to watch that video right now. But your emotions. Your day as a competitor is over, right? Now what is your job? To be a teammate. So you're going to stand right here, collect your emotions. We're going to transition from being a competitor to now cheering for our teammates and supporting the team. So collect your thoughts, collect your emotions right now. We can't fix what just happened until Monday, right? So we're going to let it go. We're going to transition into being a teammate now. And we're going to have fun and we're going to get ready for the next tournament together, okay? You did great today. You had some tough matches. That's all it really came down to. It's not like you got blown out of the water. You had some tough matches, okay? We'll get that stuff fixed up. You're going to get a lot of golds. Might not happen today, but you're going to get a lot of golds, okay? So, welcome back. Um, so, you say, uh, Trey, that jiu-jitsu saved your life. Um, tell us a little bit about what kind of a household you grew up in. I grew up in pretty chaotic conditions. Um, you know, I, I was definitely a kid that got love in different places, and there was times in my life I was safer than others. But um, throughout my life, especially my early childhood, um, I just was around a lot of adults that were really unsafe. Um, I had a stepdad that was pretty physically abusive, um, and just kind of had to navigate that as a child. And, you know, I was around some other adults that, you know, were also not safe adults. And with my stepdad being a police officer, it was like extra mm -hmm. hard for me because I'm like, who would I even turn to if I wanted to get this guy in trouble, which kind of, you know led me down different paths as like a younger person. Um, but, you know, learning how to try to keep yourself safe when you're super duper young leads to just kind of weird habits and things that you have to kind of do to, to operate in life that most people don't have to do, at least until they're adults. Um, so kind of started from there and then had a pretty wild teenage era kind of stemming from the same things that led into a pretty wild young adult era. And then, you know, I was able to find jujitsu and kind of turn some things around in my mid twenties. So pretty grateful that I was able to, to find something that I was super passionate about and has really positive um, kind of side effects on your life. So what kind of wild things are we talking about, Trey? <laughs> I was a pretty wild child. I mean, I like the, the craziest thing that I did as a teenager was I ran away for 18 months when I was like 14 years old. And so, you know, like for me at the time, it was something where I thought it was just like, I have kind of full autonomy over my safety. When right. in reality, looking back on it now, I was in one of the most unsafe situations that I ever put myself in over those 18 months. So where did you go for, where did you go for 18 months? I, I like kind of, I've, I weirdly like, found these parents like I, I have an ability to kind of especially when I was younger to kind of pick out parents that also weren't the best safest parents and so I kind of latched on to a few families that didn't really care that I had ran away and didn't really think to ask their son why I was staying at their house for three weeks at a time and so just kind of surf my way around for for those 18 months um kind of wearing my welcome out here and there and then finding a new spot and until I wore that welcome out there and then I'd move on to the next place. So um, just kind of tried to figure out couches and room 
floors to sleep on for for those 18 months all right okay because it was your mother i think that got married multiple times is that right yeah my mom uh has been married a few times and you know i've had some stepdads that were pretty awesome momentarily and then you know had their own problems and uh, my first stepdad was definitely the one that kind of kick-started the the way that i i initially approached life um you know i think as a child he was pretty severely abused from what i've you know gathered in my lifetime and so for him to you know hit me or to hit me with a belt um wasn't a big deal you know like it, it was something that he was pretty familiar with um but for me as a little boy it was definitely mm -hmm. something that made me just not feel like I could depend on people that I should have been able to depend on. You know, I didn't really have a dad at that point in my life. And the the closest thing I had to it was a police officer who kind of took his days out on me, you know? And so um, just kind of had to navigate that a lot as a child. And then my mom ended up divorcing him and marrying what was probably the best stepdad that I had at the time. Um, but later on in my life, he ended up drinking himself to death. Um, so, you know, kind of touching on negative relationships with alcohol in my life. There's been a lot of these scenarios where if you really look back on it, there's there's alcohol behind the, the doors, so to say, um, you know, with a lot of these different little traumatic things that have happened in my life. There was generally an adult on alcohol or some other substance that was making them not make great adult decisions. So. Yeah, in my book, actually, I write a lot about raising boys because I have two sons as well. So did you think that whilst you were growing up or maybe even when you were a little bit older that it's quite normal for children to grow up like that? I mean, I it wasn't probably until like middle school or high school that I realized that that wasn't normal. Like I thought that mm -hmm. everybody got beat with belts, you know, like the one that I, I look back on the most and it like makes me want to strangle this dude because I have to see him every once in a while when I go to like oh, family right. events. It's like, you know, I, I got woken up at like four in the morning because I left my bike out. He was a police officer. He'd get home at like four in the morning and I got woken up by getting thrown across my room through a wall. And like as a kid, if that's happening to you, you definitely like it's your normal. You may not even you may, may realize it's not normal, but it's your normal. And, you know, when, when I got into high school and you start talking to your friends and they're like, yeah, you know, like my mom grounded me and you're like, what is grounding? Like, I, I want to get some of this grounding stuff. That sounds pretty awesome to me. Um, kind of started to realize it. And then definitely as an adult, you know, realize that there's a huge power dynamic between adults and even teenagers, much less children. And so as a young adult, it was definitely a more bitter thing. It was like, dang, I can't believe nobody was sticking up for me and having to navigate through those feelings was kind of tough. Um, you know, it's really easy to fall into that like pity party. I don't want to like diminish anybody, you know, who is being abused, but it's like it happened. But for my early adulthood, I kind of let that and some other situations that had happened earlier in my life dictate how I interacted with the world when I stopped doing that, I was much more successful and that all kind of coalesced with me finding jujitsu. So again, just feeling super lucky that I was able to find something that centered my life, made me realize that, you know, I can keep myself safe. Like I have always been a fairly average size man. So I haven't felt very unsafe as an adult, but those feelings linger from when you're a kid, you know, even if you are safe, you don't necessarily relax into that safety. And so you know, finding jujitsu has given me that ability to realize that not only am I safe, but I am a safe adult for many, many children in our program for my own son, for my nephews and niece. And so, um, you know, it's, it's not the ideal way to approach it, but, you know, I think some people can take those lessons, take those bad things and, and turn them into something that's a little bit more positive, at least just for other people, even if it's not for, you know, yourself, you can't go back and take away what happened, but um, kind of getting to live vicariously through other kids who are around safe adults, you get to feel that that feeling a little bit. So it's a pretty cool um, kind of trade off. Being that safe adult, you get to have some of those vicarious feelings that you didn't get to have as a child. So yeah, that's quite nice, actually. At least you get to kind of yeah live it through their eyes a little bit, I guess. Yeah. But even when you were younger, you were a high. You were competing, I think, at a high level in sports. 
Um, yeah. And there you encountered coaches as well? I did uh, wrestling as a little boy. So, you know, Olymp- we have folk style wrestling here in America, but for, you know, European people, you know, freestyle Olympic style wrestling. Um, I played American football growing up from a very young age. Um, I played traveling baseball, um, you know, America's pastime. And I played that at probably the highest level that I played sports as a little kid. I was on a traveling baseball team. So we'd go to tournaments outside of Colorado, you know, a couple times a month at least, and then to the higher level tournaments within Colorado. And then in high school, um, I did a year of track and field, and then I played four years of rugby and played football and wrestled as well. So how did you find the coaches that you encountered? Um, you know, America's got a really strong sporting system. I've had some friends that have moved outside of the States, um, you know, with their children and America really pushes sports. You can, you can approach sports at an entry level at any age. So you could be 14 years old and you want to start wrestling. There's a program for you. If you're 14 and you've been wrestling since you're four, there's higher level programs for you and you kind of fall into different leagues and different things like that. So I think, you know, in America in general, um, especially my generation of, of Mm -hmm. people were highly encouraged to do sports. And, you know, my mom was a college basketball player. So, you know, I came from an athletic family and so I was encouraged to do those sports and just kind of fell into the typical American sports, American football, baseball. In high school, I found rugby, which is growing in America, but not an ultra popular Mm -hmm. sport here. So that was kind of only the sport that I like really, truly fell into besides jujitsu. Everything else was, you know, my mom signing me up or an uncle encouraging my mom to sign me up for a sport or whatever. Yeah, and very nice. So how did you get into jujitsu? How did you find that? Um, I think a lot of people, again, especially my age, um, kind of first started hearing about jujitsu from the Joe Rogan experience. Um, (laughs) If if you're an American man between 35 and 20, um, you know, there's a good chance you've listened to an episode of that. And it's, it's a pretty recurring topic on the show, but specifically there was, there was one episode where he really was kind of touting the benefits of jujitsu and, at that point in my life, I was pretty resigned to the fact that like, man, I don't even, I was like 23 when I first started hearing about, um, you know, jujitsu more consistently and had kind of resigned to the fact that like, probably not going to live past 30. Like I'm going to the bars all the time. I'm constantly sad. I'm not in good shape. I'm, you know, in the worst shape I've ever been in in my entire life. I grew up as an athlete and now I'm borderline obese and, um, drove past this jiu-jitsu academy called Zingano Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Broomfield like for six months because I was on a job site doing right. construction at the time and just had to drive past it every day. And like that that 10 minutes of him talking about how jiu-jitsu can change people's lives would just play through my head every time that I saw it. And I finally went in for a class and it was kind of one of those things where it was like, not to be overly dramatic, but it was like, I only had a couple of things left I wanted to do in life. You know, I wasn't necessarily like outright suicidal at that point, but definitely was something that was consistently on my mind. And so when I went to my first jujitsu class, it was like, man, you know, I'm going to do this for a few months and then I'm going to kind of reassess and, you know, decide what I want to do with my life. And I went into my first jujitsu class and I came out of it and, was the happiest I'd ever been since I was a little kid and wow. saw this future that I'd never been able to plan out. I'd, I'd kind of lived week to week or at best month to month. Like I knew I needed an oil change next month, but that was like, as far as I could think out. And after my first class, I was like, this is all just about how much you come, how hard you're willing to work and how much effort you put into it. And if I put in effort, I could own a gym someday. Like, first class it was like i i'd seen this future which is ultra ridiculous for anybody who's done jujitsu for you to go to your first class and be like i'm gonna be not only to be like i'm gonna be a black belt someday after my first class but to then you know kind of see a future in it and to see something where it was like i wasn't happy with my job i had a really really good job in a union with benefits and great pay and um you know if you're doing construction that's kind of the dream in America to find a construction job like that. And, 
it was, I just never was happy doing it. But, you know, again, after that first jujitsu class, it was like the, the wheels started turning in my head and I was happy for a few days, like truly, truly happy. And then went back to another class and everything kind of, you know, fell from there, which was kind of a, a, a blessing that, you know, at the time I didn't really realize, but kind of snapped me out of that suicidal ideation and that idea that I was a loser and I was always going to be a loser. It like opened up the door for me to find ways to love myself for the first time, which for some people might be odd. You know, if you come to a jujitsu class, it's, it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of, you know, people controlling other people on the ground, trying to bend their arm the wrong way and choke them. And, you know, that's... my my son does jujitsu. Yeah. And I have to, he does it on me when he gets home. It's like, Oh, let me show you what I did. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I think a lot of people, you learn to love yourself enough to not let that more experienced people just like beat up on you. They're going to beat you, but you're not going to beat up on me. Like I love myself enough to keep my arms in front of my chest so that you don't just get to crush my body. I love myself enough to continue to move. And that gave me the ability to kind of look at my life and be like, man, like these people you're meeting at jujitsu are nicer to you than you are to you you got to change that. Like there's, there, it shouldn't be that way. You shouldn't have wow. strangers who barely know you from Tim or Tom treating you better than you treat yourself. And so through a lot of positive influence and just outright love for, for jujitsu and the culture of jujitsu allowed me to start loving myself for the first time and realizing that I'd never loved myself, you know, and that's a hard realization, but it's something that once you have it and you start loving yourself is, is worth that like feeling in your chest for a little while when you realize like, dang, I've never taken care of myself. I've never loved myself like I should, but again, kind of found my blessing and found a way to get back into shape and find something I love and find the ability to love myself, you know? That's amazing. That's so good. Did it just go from just jujitsu? Did you have any therapy as well? Or I, you know, I, I reached out to a therapist um, and, you know, I had a, a session or two, I believe with them. And it just, for me, I was at a point in my life where um, I was very solution oriented and, right. you know, I know you have to hash through whatever problems you have in therapy and I don't want to push anyone away from therapy. But for me personally, I was at a point in my life when I had, reached out to a therapist where I'd kind of learned some of those skills. I'd learned some coping skills. I had learned to not beat myself up over mistakes that I had made. I had learned to approach some of the bad things that had happened in my life and refile them and, you know, find ways to make myself okay with some of the things that had happened to me, whether that was through personal work or through those vicarious situations that we talk about, you know, like, I don't know that every part of my soul will be healed from when I was a little kid, but there's moments on the mat when a five-year-old says, Oh, I love you, coach Trey, you know, just oh. some random stranger is like, I love you. I love being around you is, is the second best thing to like getting that early, you know? Mm, very sweet. And what kind of a coach are you? What kind of coaching style do you have? Um, I, I, I kind of combine a lot of my life. I've I've lived a strange life. I think you find that a lot with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instructors. Like we're we're circle people trying to fit into square holes our whole life until we find Jiu-Jitsu. And so you know I've combined some things from I worked in a daycare when I was younger um, for a couple of years when I was in high school, and then immediately after high school that was a Montessori daycare, and. Um, some of the things that I pulled from Montessori is letting kids fail and succeed on their own. Um, I'm a big proponent of that. I, I try to put kids in situations where they can be successful, but not taking away failure from kids. I think wow. that's like one of the reasons I can set myself apart from a lot of people who do train kids is I'm comfortable with letting kids fail. And then having that failure be matched with an adult that's ready to help them with tools and frameworks to move on from that loss or that bad moment or the bump that you got on your cheek from someone's knee when you guys were doing jujitsu. Um, on top of that, you know, I've worked in restaurants. I was a bouncer. And so managing big groups and <laughs> keeping your eyes all over the mats, using those skills. But at the end of the day, um, 
one of the things I tell kids, especially new kids in our program is I'm allergic to negativity, whether that is self negativity or negativity driven towards somebody else. Um, you know, that conversation that I told you I had to kind of have with myself where I'm like, people around you love you more than you love you. Sometimes you have to have that conversation with kids, you know, they're like, I suck at this thing or this person always beats me. And, you know, we have to acknowledge truth. You lost or that person is better than you right now. But if you continue to work, if you continue to do these things, are you going to be able to close that gap? Hey, you're not feeling super successful right now. What's one thing that we could change about this? Is it your intensity? Is it that you're not making the right movements? Is it that you're not preparing yourself before class? Did you drink enough water today? Did you have healthy meals? Are you on your iPad all day long? Cause I can guarantee you the kid who just beat you. I know him and I know his family. They don't use iPad. Like, you know, trying to show them that that's good. <laughs> set yourself up for successes outside of just putting your feet out on the mats and trying to be mm-hmm. a little jujitsu savage. Um, but really just trying to encourage a culture where one of the, the tenants in our class is we have four responsibilities every day. And the first responsibility is your safety. You have to keep yourself safe at all times. The next one is your partner's safety. The third priority is your improvement. And the fourth priority is your partner's improvement. And if you don't cover all four of those in a day, you haven't had a successful class. You might have stayed safe. You might have kept someone safe. If you got better, but you didn't help anybody on the mats get better on that day, you didn't have a successful class. And so that breeds a culture of kids who are highly encouraging each other, that they know that I don't take any negative talk. I don't take bickering. I don't, it's all positivity on the mats and it stays that way or you keep your mouth shut and you train, you know, that's, that's kind of where it comes from. And that culture leads to some really sweet kids. Um, the video that we watched earlier of my student, you know, he's one of the best teammates on the team. After he stopped crying in that video, he collected himself. He went and got his bronze medal because he took third place that day. Mm-hmm. And Five minutes later, he was over my shoulder, encouraging a teammate in a match, you know, going from crying to being that teammate. And, you know, the only way that we make that transition is day to day. We encourage those behaviors. So kind of a long winded answer. But, you know, my coaching style is based in positivity, improvement and helping others improve and, you know, bringing that to kids as young as three years old. So. Yeah, very sweet. (laughs) And why do kids eat broccoli if you tell them to, but not their parents? <laughs> I, I was, I, when TED Talks were still, you know, kind of a cooler thing, I was like, this mm-hmm. is going to be a TED Talk someday. But I think most kids, um, like, need a Rafiki in their life. Most people have seen The Lion King. Most people, if you rewatch The Lion King after hearing this, will see The Lion King very differently. But Simba, main character, is he has everything in front of him. Like he has a perfect life. He has a dad, a mom, and he doesn't want to listen to anybody, right? He just wants to go to the elephant graveyard. And I think kids, they don't want to listen to their parents. They don't want to <laughs> listen to their family. So in the in the movie, it's kind of perfect. And, you know, your bad decisions affecting other people. Uh, obviously, it's a pretty large message when his dad dies. But if you, if you look at the movie through that, like your bad decisions led to your family member, you know, being in danger. And then I kind of approach Timon and Pumbaa as like teenage friends. Were Timon and Pumbaa bad for Simba? No, like they help keep him alive, but lions aren't supposed to eat bugs. And so <laughs> when you're a teenager, sometimes your friends encourage you to eat bugs. And, you know, Simba was no different than any of the kids that we interact with on a day to day basis. And then at the end of the movie, this mystic monkey with a stick tells him the same thing that everybody's told him for the entire movie. And he's like, that's such a good idea. I'm going to listen to this mystic monkey that told me the same thing my dad told me in the opening credits of the movie. Um, So (laughs) I kind of try to occupy that role as a Rafiki and I take it pretty seriously. And, you know, I, I understand that I'm not their parents and their parents have ultimate authority over them. But um, if you can be a positive, safe adult that parents trust Um, you get to interact with more children and you get to provide that Rafiki role. And I think that a lot of kids find Rafikis in different places in their life. A lot of us, it's an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or a teacher or a coach, you know, it could even be your friend's parent. You know, I had some, some people that 
when I was younger, I think they kind of knew that my life wasn't awesome. And I spent a summer with one of my baseball coaches and I just was like, this is awesome. You know, I'm, I'm hanging out with my friend all summer and looking back on it as an adult. I think that family was like, Hey, let's kind of take him out of this situation that he's in. And, you know, I got to have that Rafiki effect from those people taking care of me. So I think kids find their Rafikis in other ways um, other than, you know, just coaches. But I think it's important that kids do have those opportunities to have the right Rafiki in front of them. Um, and then as a parent, when you have those Rafikis, it's someone you can lean into, you know, Hey, my kid is giving me attitude at home. When I have a conversation with one of my students about that, like they go white, they know I'm not going to be mean to them. They know I'm one of the nicest adults that they interact with, but they know that I'm all about rules and I'm all about positivity. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing it at home, we're going to talk. And then, you know, next week I ask the parents, how have they been? They're like, oh, they're putting everybody's shoes in their room. They're clearing the table. And it's just, again, from talking to some mystic monkey wearing a black belt, you know, they're like, that's a great idea. I'm going to behave how my parents want me to. That's so cool. <laughs> how was the road to the black belt? Was it difficult to get a black belt? Jiu-jitsu is a, a strange sport. We we constantly are talking smack on on other martial arts and sports, but it's a notoriously hard black belt to get. Mm -hmm. Um they say, you know, on average, if you're if you're looking at timelines, you're talking 10 to 12 years if you're training consistently. Um, but I meet people commonly who are 15 years into their, their black belt. And for one reason or another, haven't achieved that black belt, you know, 15 years in 13 years in 12 years in 10 years in. Um, so for me, being able to lean into wrestling, which is a grappling sport allowed me to approach it a lot faster than I think a lot of people would, because I have that time on the mat. I have strong neck muscles from wrestling my whole life. And so there's certain things that I could do that most people weren't able to do right away in the beginning and uh, just kept kept my nose to the grindstone and just kept training and eventually quit my union job. Um, just walked off a job site one day because I was like, this is not it. Like I was with a crew of 50 people and there's this common phrase that people will tell you if you were a tradie and it's like, hey, find a trade. So that if you ever want to pursue your passion, you'll always have your trade to fall back on. And I was like, okay, I'm in a room with 50, 50 tradies who've done a really high paying construction job. And I was like, Hey, has anybody ever pursued a passion in life? And <laughs> not only was the answer no, but I started to look around and great people, great men. I learned a lot of great things in construction from a lot of good people, but I look around and it's like, you know, people who've been divorced multiple times, people who don't have healthy relationships with alcohol and substances, people who go home to a dog and a six pack of beer every night. And, you know, I'm like, I know that this is not my tribe. It's a good tribe. It served its purpose mm -hmm. in my life, but you know, I need to to stick more with the jujitsu people where I'm receiving that positive energy, where I'm around people who are improving. So I was able to make that, that transition a little easier for me. But after quitting that job, I got a job bouncing. Um, so it was like a security guard so that I could train in the morning and in the evening and then work overnight as a security guard and transitioned from that to working in fine dining restaurants here in uh, Denver, Colorado. And that got me to the point where I eventually was able to work my way into just doing jujitsu full time. Um, but, you know, quit a really stable, awesome job to be a security guard and to have a couple kids jujitsu classes a week at that point. But I could see that even though I was in the middle, which is purple belt, blue belt area, I think at that point, um, I knew that this was my life and I'd never committed to myself. And that was the first time that I truly believed in the commitment. I had talked about it a lot. I told people, Hey, since my first day, I've dreamed of opening a gym, but that was really the first, big step that I made into it. And, you know, I, I wish I could go back and like shake my own hand a couple of times, like different me's that I didn't think was awesome at the time. And I wish I could go back to that guy that went in the first class. And I really wish I could go back into time and meet me when I was quitting that job and just say, Hey, you're making the right decision. You know, you're doing the right thing, but I don't know if I would have been as, as convicted if I didn't have the fear behind me a little bit as well. Quite funny because I went into, into tennis and when I left my job and I'm going to be a tennis coach, everyone was like, 
It was the best decision I ever made. So it just made me happy on a daily basis, which previous jobs didn't. So, yeah. It's amazing. I, I, I definitely have friends that still do jobs that they don't love. And, mm. you know, when I talk to them about their jobs, it makes me feel very grateful for, for what I have in jujitsu, similar to you, where it's like, I get to do what I, the, the only thing I've ever truly loved doing other than, you know, being a dad and having a family that's been pretty awesome. But you know, as far as like what I love to do in life, you know, jujitsu offers that to me. So I feel really blessed when I hear people complaining about their real jobs. I always am like, just quit. Like, I want to tell you just to quit. But I don't <laughs> yeah. know if you have plans like I have. So I don't want to be that guy. But it's always like my first reaction, like, just quit. Find something that makes you happy. But a pretty scary leap. Yeah, I wrote that in, about that in my book, actually, how I left the job in transition. And sometimes when I'm having a hard day, I'm thinking, oh, this and that. And I'm like, listen, I coach tennis for a living. I'm on a tennis court every day. Let me not complain about my life. <laughs> there are worse things out there than living the leisurely life that I do, right? So um, just one thing, I, yeah, just going back a little bit about kind of misbehaving kids and stuff. What is the difference between a bad child and a child that just does bad things? Kind of comes from your childhood a little bit as well, I think. I've only met two bad children in my whole time coaching, in my whole lifetime. I've, I've been around thousands of kids through Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu alone. And I've only met two kids that like I didn't have the tools and didn't know what to do to change their behaviors. Um, I'm pretty into psychology and, you know, looking at those kids there, there were much deeper psychological issues that were going on with them. Um, so I think most kids are good kids. I think that a lot of kids, um, that make bad decisions, it comes from two different things. Sometimes attention is attention. And mm. so if all you're getting is negative attention in your life, um, you will seek out attention and, and you don't care if it's positive because in your experience, you, you don't even know what positive experiences feel like. Wow. So you're, you're just seeking out that negative attention. And then I think most of the time when, when a kid is doing something that is off base or in a not age appropriate, or they're just flat out making bad decisions, there's usually something deeper, you know, and it's not always, um, you know, an abusive home, you know, something that I've had to learn over the last few years is not comparing what happened to me right. to what's going on in my students' lives. Um, I'm very lucky that the the location our gym is in is a very um, high socioeconomic um, type of area. And so a lot of the kids that I deal with haven't had to deal with, you know, being poor and haven't had to deal with um, split parent household, you know, the, the County that we're in actually has the most, you know, cohesive family units in per capita in Colorado. And so figuring out, you know, when this kid's dad is going out of town for two weeks for work, that's to them, like the mom comes up and says they're acting terrible. It's like, for me, I can see that, okay, there's been a big disruption in this kid's life. Let's not forget that the behavior needs to change, but let's not forget that. Let's yeah. not just act like you have a bad kid. Oh, when his dad's here, he behaves. Okay. Well, what, what are the reasons behind that? Maybe dad and him have a different relationship than you do. Maybe dad is a little bit more stern when they're saying things with him. And, you know, I'd like to give you those tools, but I, I usually will come from a place with most kids that are behaving bad or if their parents bring them in and they're like, you know, they don't pay attention in school. They don't do X, Y, Z things. Um, I think from working in a daycare, you don't get the option of like not hanging out with that kid all day. So you have to figure out a way to make it work. Yeah. Um, but just in general, I would say, you know, most kids aren't bad kids, no matter what they're doing, it could be terrible, terrible, terrible decisions that they're making in their life. Um, but it usually stems from something and it's, it can yeah. be hard sometimes if you look at a kid's life and you're like coming from a life like mine, like, oh, this kid's never lived in a household that's literally going paycheck to paycheck. This kid's never moved three times in a year. Um, it can be hard to relate to to where they're at in life, but they, they need that framework from an adult 
And sometimes as a parent, either because of that Rafiki effect, you're just not able to get through to them or because it's hard being a parent, um, you know, you're not able to figure that stuff out. And I think that's where getting your kid into a sport or an activity or around the right types of kids um, can sort out some of those problems pretty immediately. When you, when you surround yourself with more positive people, it's hard to, to act negative um, or to do negative things. So, you know, I think that instead of, always necessarily like trying to change the behavior it's like we can change kids environments much easier um we can set them up with a new friend group we can put them into a different school we can request like for me i think something that a lot of boy families should do is if you have a boy and they're not behaving at school i had a male teacher in my fifth and sixth grade year and it was like the most successful year i had right and it was for one reason or another, when I was a boy, I listened better when I was dealing with a man. And so, you know, trying to find those situations, oh, well, my school doesn't have, you know, a male teacher or whatever, like maybe it's better for your kid to move over for a school so that they can have that male teacher. Um, you know, I think that that's not the only solution, but just looking for those things yeah. to to set them up for success. And if they fail, okay, they, they failed, but trying to put them in positions that they can be successful, whether that is figuring out that your kid listens better to an, an adult man or an adult woman, it could go both ways and, and trying to set yourself and your kid up for that success, um, I think can, can be very beneficial. Yeah, I agree. Actually, it's not always a child. You have to look at the um, reasons why they're, why they're acting out. So, um yeah okay so you have a baby now and you're in a happy relationship so how was that kind of easy to transition into a relationship for you given what you've been through or have you done enough work on yourself for it to be easier I guess when I had met my wife um I had spent like a good probably a year and a half of I'd been on you know, some dates, but had not dated anybody like consistently. And I just kind of realized like I had, I had so many things going on. I was pushing so hard towards my goal that it was like the one place in my life that I realized like, I'm still not experiencing success with relationships. And I think it has a lot more to do with myself and how I was loved as a child and how I learned to love people as a child. And so I took a year and a half to just spend almost every weekend with my friends and myself and doing things by myself. And, and when I met my wife, I was in a really good place. I had kind of decided, you know, when I do start dating again, I'm, I'm not going to waste people's time. I'm going to try to find somebody that, you know, I would want to marry. Like I was 30, I think at that time. So it was, you know, got to be a little bit more serious about life. And I had, also reached a point where I was okay with not finding that. And I realized mm-hmm. that I had something that was pretty awesome in jujitsu. And when I stopped looking so hard for it, you know, it kind of fell into my lap. And luckily I had taken that time to, to figure out some of the things that I do. Um, I'm, I haven't, you know, had a lot of experience with therapists, but I look up different terms that I see online and I'm like, Oh, love bombing. Like, I definitely do that to people. Oh, like having trauma bonds with people, like the people I was with, I would always be like, why are they so kooky? And then it's like, I'm picking people that had different childhoods to mine, but that caused similar results. And so, um, finding my wife was pretty awesome. She grew up in Siberia, uh, in Russia. And so she's very different to a lot of people that I met. She grew up in a smaller place that moves slower and, um, it's much more safe. Um, so she approaches the world very differently to me. And I think it's good to have that balance. I'm for right or for wrong. I'm constantly on point with everything. When we go grocery shopping, you know, I'm always looking around, like I'm able to relax in those situations, but my wife just kind of assumes everybody's nice and good and nothing bad will ever happen. And I really appreciate that about her because it allowed me to relax a little bit. Like, you know, when we're grocery shopping or when we're out doing things like, Hey, there might be somebody bad here, but I think we're okay in this situation. So, um, you know, meeting her was, was really awesome. And, you know, we had, um, 
we had our son a year ago yesterday. His oh, birthday was happy yesterday. Birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I think when I when I had a son, I thought that I had fully come to terms with everything that had ever happened to me in my life and all the feelings that I had inside of myself and very quickly realized that there were some things I was bitter about. And so over the last year, I've tried to work past that bitterness and really just realize what a blessing having a baby is and having a healthy baby. Um, you know, I have all these things in front of me and I, I have to face those things that are coming up and I have to find a way to file them inside of my body because they're going to be there forever. And I have to find a way to make sure that my actions don't mirror those actions in my life for my son. And so as we've gotten closer to his first birthday, a lot of those bitter feelings have turned into this feeling of like, okay, when I have that bitter feeling, it's just my body telling me what I don't want. And so if it makes me feel like that. I'm never going to make another human being feel like that, especially my son. Um, so again, you know, I've kind of mentioned this before. It's not the best way to approach life. You don't want to be an adult and figuring these things out in your thirties, but, um, it's better than nothing. And better than never for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of don't face the things that has happened to them in their life where they allow those things to control how they interact with the world and other people and, and especially themselves. That's something that like a lot of people don't talk about is, you know, you can, you can bring up things that have been traumatic in your life. And I never want to diminish that for somebody, but mm -hmm. do you want to let it run the rest of your life? And it, it's not me saying you need to just let it go. You need to build a framework for yourself to analyze that. And some people find that framework through therapy. Some people find it through their church or their mosque or their synagogue. Some people find it through jujitsu. Some people find it through tennis. Some people find it through, you know, these different activities in our life, but, um, you, you got to face it. And at a certain point when it's not serving you, I'm very into stoic philosophy and like when feelings aren't serving you anymore, you have to find ways to let them go or be okay with them. And that's, that's not an easy ask. And it's definitely not been easy for me. The big feeling I've had over the last year has just been like realizing how unsafe I was. That's, you know, I always knew that my childhood wasn't normal, but now having a baby, it's like, how could I possibly have been put into some of these situations? How could I have, you know, when I ran away, I think my mom was afraid um, that she would lose custody of my brother and sister. And so she never called the cops. You know, wow. I think most parents, when your child or your teenager is gone for a day, most people would call the police. And I, awesome. I didn't realize that feeling of like, nobody was even looking for me. It wasn't that like running away was one thing, but then to know that nobody was looking for me was like, a whole different feeling. And as a, as a father, I can't understand that as, as a son, as a family member, I can forgive, but as a, as a father, it's just like, it does not make sense to me. You know, it, it, I can't wrap my head around some of the behaviors that I faced as a child and a, as a teenager with adults and, and, you know, the way that I interacted with adults is not how I want to interact with children in my life ever. You know, I want to be a person that kids feel like they can turn to when they're being bullied or if they have a tough situation in their life or if they're having a hard time making friends, you know, I want to be that person. And I definitely never want to make a kid feel unsafe or feel like they, they can't express themselves fully in front of me. I want them to be as silly and awesome and childlike as they need to be in class. And, you know, I, I, I like holding that space for other people, but like I said, it's, it's a bit of a bitter feeling. Like why did nobody hold that space for me when I was a little kid? So try not to let those bitter feelings bleed into my life and facing them and trying to figure out how I'm going to approach those when they come up sometimes can be difficult, but over the years of learning how to deal with those different feelings at different times, I'm, I just realized it's work. It's just, not ignoring the feelings, not ignoring why you feel that way. Sometimes mm -hmm. it feels silly. You're like, ah, I shouldn't be mad about that. I mean, I got thrown through a wall as a little kid. So 
this other thing shouldn't be a big deal. Like they're separate things and they, they affect you differently. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. I think your self-awareness is actually just so inspiring. Um, and I think with these things, maybe we have to look at this fact that it's not really our fault because it's not a child's fault that they've been dealt with like that. Right. But I think it's sometimes hard to kind of pull that away from yourself. Um, yeah. But yeah, oh, it's been amazing talking to you, Trey. Um, yeah. Would you have like a positive or like a takeaway for our viewers and listeners um, towards the end of our conversation? Uh, there's a lot of things that I like to to latch into, um, but I I love just looking up different philosophies, whether it be Stoic. I'm, uh, earlier in my life, I was very into Buddhism, and I think one of the things that changed my life is a quote from the Buddha and the quote goes that um, a thousand candles can be lit from the flame of a single candle and the life of that candle won't be diminished. Happiness never decreases from being shared. And so for me, it's realizing that even on those hard days, if I can share happy moments with people, it doesn't diminish those feelings that I'm feeling, but it does bring positive feelings to me and to others and if you are that person who's constantly trying to light other people's wicks, your life is going to fall into place in a way that, you know, is pretty uncontrollable, but it's like uncontrollable in a positive way. I think a lot of people have felt that mm -hmm. uncontrolled chaos in their life. But when you start trying to be that light, it's, you start attracting people who are like that. You start attracting people who want to be around people like that. And you just slowly start realizing that your life, gets better when you're trying to share happiness with other people. So that's, that's probably the, the best advice I could give people is, you know, it's days are dark, but when you share them with other people, sometimes your light might be smaller, but because you've lit someone's candle before they're, they're willing to relight your wick and, and help you when you need help. And you can be there for other people in that way as well. I love that. That's beautiful. Trey, thank you so much for being my guest today. <laughs>